Happy Sabbath, all of you. Welcome to our worship service. Not only those who are sitting here today, but um, watching BLBN, a live stream or YouTube, welcome and I wish your blessing uh, as you uh, watch the worship, uh, partake of the worship service today. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, <clears throat> Today, we all have a lot of our members are probably not here because they're attending the Oregon camp meeting. I know my wife is up there, and I've missed her this week, uh, camping out with my daughter and her grandchildren. Um, and uh, one of the announcements is uh, Vacation Bible School starts next Monday for kids 5 to 12. And there's a flyer in the bulletin that you can refer to for more information. And there will be a memorial service next Sabbath, July 30, at 2.30 p.m. for Dr. Frank Hurd. Now, <clears throat> I've been asked to give a short testimony, if that's possible. Uh, it's not my favorite thing to do, to talk about personal things. But I'm doing it for two reasons, and that is that God might be glorified, and that um, those who pray for others are encouraged, the fact that God answers prayer. So um, I've had a lot of problems with my uh, sciatic nerve on my left leg here the last month. Um, I strained my back and then it developed into uh, really bad nerve pain down my leg so much that I couldn't sleep at night without some um, pretty powerful uh, painkillers. Um, but I was able to limp around during the day and get a few things done and I had a trailer, an a enclosed car trailer that I had for sale and there was, people were coming that um, evening to pick it up and I still had a few things to do on it. So I was out there and I had carried a, a ladder over there to reach part of what I needed to do that was higher up. And uh, I don't know, in doing that somehow, I really aggravated the, uh, the uh, sciatic nerves to the extent that it was so painful, I had to get off the ladder and lay down on the bottom, on the, on the floor of the trailer for a little bit. And then I tried to get back to the house, which my, my, I, I couldn't put any way, uh, uh, weight on that leg. It was so painful. But I called for Becky. She didn't hear me. So I struggled up to the, uh, the garage kitchen door, and she came and helped me uh, into the bedroom to lay down on the bed. Uh, incredible pain, some of the worst I've ever felt. And I knew these people were coming, so I called John Morrow to see if he could come do the little bit of things that needed to be done that I couldn't do. And he, come over, he came over right away and did it. I really appreciated that, really appreciated that. And uh, when he was finished, Becky was helping him, uh, he came over into the bedroom and uh, sat down and prayed for me. And uh, I really appreciated that. And I had some other people call me and pray. And I contacted Donna to ask her if um, she could put me on the prayer list. Um, <clears throat> and she did. I know she said, she told me that her and um, Gloria Wilson were praying, and I know many others that I've talked to have prayed to, and I really appreciate your prayers because God answers prayers. He doesn't always answer them immediately or the way we may want, but God always hears our prayers. And when we pray for others, he hears. Him. So anyway, that evening, uh, as I was laying in bed around 10 o'clock, or one other thing I should say, I couldn't put any weight in that leg, and I knew I had to get to the bathroom now and then. So I asked uh, Becky to check with Sharon Copeland, see if they had some crutches. They did, and so even with the crutches, very painful, but that, that helped out. And I mentioned the crutches for, for a purpose. Um, as I went to bed about 10 or 10.30 and lay there, all of a sudden, the pain started going away. Uh, so much so that I could go to sleep, and in the middle of the night, when I had to go visit the restroom, I got up and walked in there and I got to thinking, where's the pain? How come I'm not having to use crutches? 
it just was like a miraculous thing. I've never had anything so dramatic happen to me. And I know it's because of the prayers of the people in this church. And uh, I just have to praise God. Thank you so much for your prayers. Uh, I, ever since that time, that pain hasn't come back. I have an MRI scheduled, and I have an appointment with the Spine Care Center in Medford to see what needs to be done. But I just praise God I've been able to do things this week. Uh, so thank you so much. Older hymns, and then we'll do some newer, um, newer songs that you guys may or may not be familiar with. We're going to start with um, 166 in the hymnal, and then um, we'll do 159 after that. And we're going to do um, all the verses of 166. And if you It'd be awesome if you guys would stand up for this first one because it's a really, it's a really um, awesome, um, really praising song. next song is 159 in the hymnal, uh, The Old Rugged Cross, and we'll do all verses of this one as well.
The, there's some lyrics in there. Um, the second verse, um, yeah, for the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. I love that. Okay. We're going to do a newer song. We're going to do, it's called Goodness of God. It's by a group called Bethel Music, if you guys have heard that. i got to look it up on my phone because I forgot my um, my lyrics. But it was the same title as um, Pastor's Sermon today, so I thought it'd be a good, good opportunity to, to sing it. Yeah. And then right after Goodness of God, we'll like go right into um, one that you guys know. It's 633 in the hymnal. Um, we'll go just directly from Goodness of God right into that one. Okay. Okay, here we go. Thank you.
goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down and surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. Father, thank you for being here with us today. And Lord, thank you for your goodness. As we sang about, Lord, we will sing of the goodness of God. Even in the darkest nights, Lord, we, we know that you love us, that you are by our side. Please be with us here this morning in this worship service, that we would worship you, that we would glorify and honor you, Lord, in our lives not only today, but each and every day. Please bless this service. May your name be lifted up as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So now is our time for our children to come forward. We have a children's story for you. But come forward, children, and pick up these nets here so you can collect all these monies. These go for our worthy student fund to help children to be able to, uh, that would like a Christian education, to come and... Uh, be able to partake of a Christian education. So children, come forward and get your... Which one do you like? What color would you like there? You want pink? 
pink? There you go, pink. You want a purple one? You want a purple one? Wait, you want blue? There you go. Okay. We appreciate all your generosity, everyone. These, these uh, nets are pretty full. You have a seat there. We'll have our children's story. Young lady, Elta Austin's having the children's story this morning. Hi, are you waiting for a plane? Huh? Are you all? A plane. A plane, yeah. Oh, maybe you're not. Well, well, you know, a couple weeks ago, my husband and our four-year-old granddaughter went on a trip. My husband's from Chicagoland. Does anybody know where Chicagoland is? It's about, well, by plane, it's about five hours away, but... It's 2,000 miles away. It's in the Midwest, and he grew up there. So we go back. Usually he goes back every year to visit his family and friends. And so this year, my granddaughter and I decided to go. But there's a lot to do before you go on a trip. Have you ever noticed that? You got... You have to get... First thing you have to do is you have to make sure you find a ticket. Yeah, you need, a, you need a ticket to go. And so we, we looked online. We did our own searching and found some tickets. So we bought our tickets online. So we have, we have our ticket. We have our itinerary that tells us where we're going and what we need to do. So we have that. And we have printed it all out, and it's all ready to go. And then we have to pack. You know, so you have to make sure that you have the right clothes to wear because it's going to be hot and humid in Chicago. Yes. My mom packs my 
packed my suitcase. She pa Oh, how nice of her. We went, um, we went to, um, Mexico? Yeah, we went to Mexico for my first time once. Wow, that is exciting. Well, this was our first, our, our granddaughter's first time traveling in an airplane. So anyway, so we packed the clothes that we needed so that, because it's hot and humid there, that means that you want to wear really cool clothes, you know, not just cool looking clothes, but cool clothes that you won't get all hot in. Like a sun, that's good. Yeah, we need those short sleeve sun type dresses. Yes. So then we get to the airport, and let's see if this is working. There we go. And we have to make sure that our carry on bag is the right size. So. I did a lot of research before we went and got us some new suitcases because ours were wore out. And so this was just the right size where it says one carry on. Oh, I'm standing right in front of your guys' this thing. Where it says one carry on. So this was a 9 by 14 by 22 carry on. So we have the right equipment. And then we had to go up to the, to the counter and our luggage that we checked, they gave us a baggage receipt. So that way we could pick up our extra baggage. Most of the time you want to get rid of your extra baggage, but for, in this instance, you want to keep it. Uh, the older ones know what that means. Uh, um, and then they give us boarding passes. Oh, but I forgot one very important thing you have to have. You have to have a picture ID. Why would you need a picture ID? To make sure it's you. To, do to, make sure it's you. to make sure it's you. I mean, I could go up there and say I'm anybody, and, and maybe I wasn't that person. So they look at my picture, and they look at me, and they looked at my picture again, because they don't let you wear glasses anymore when you do your driver's license. So they looked at me. I don't know. And they looked at me and they thought, okay, I think that's her. The only one that didn't need a picture ID was our granddaughter because she's too little to have a picture ID. So we had that, then we have our boarding passes, and now we have to look, okay, what gate do we go to? So we had to be in the right place at the right time, and then they called our number our, and said we were ready to board, and so we're waiting. So here's a picture this is our granddaughter waiting. As you can tell, we're, <laughs> she's really waiting. And then sometimes you're waiting so long, you fall asleep. <laughs> and this was our, actually our flight home from Chicago, which left, we had to be at the airport at 5 o'clock in the morning. So it was a little early for her. But, and so you're waiting, and you're waiting. And then finally you get on the plane, and we have to take your suitcase and your backpack, and you carry it on the plane, and you go down these really tiny aisles, and you try not to bump into people as you're going. So you try to be courteous. And so you get on the plane, and, you're, and you, then you have to find the exact seat. And it says right here, the exact seat that we had to sit in, 39C, and, and my husband was in 39A, and Robin was in 39B, something like that, or and so we're sitting there, and we have three seats. We always gave Robin the window seat so she could see out. And so she's all excited, and she took one of her favorite stuffies with her. That's brown. And this is what she said. What are we doing? Oh, we're on the plane. What are we going to do on the plane? We're going to go to Chicago. What's the plane doing right now? We're about to take off. Yeah. Is that fun? So, so we're on the plane, and we're going. Well, there was something about our flight. When you fly out of Medford to go to Chicago, you have to switch planes. So not in the air, though, fortunately. You can do it. <laughs> you land. We had to land in Denver. Now, Robin did not know this. This is Robin. 
This is my Robin. Anyway, she did not know this. And so we're flying, and we start to land. And she goes, Mimi, we're here. We're here. And I go, yes, we're here. And she goes, we're in Chicago. But you know, I was kind of looking out the window. And if any of you have ever been to Chicago, it doesn't look anything like this. This looks more like the Rockies. And Denver is surrounded by mountains, and it's also a mile high, the city is. So I said, no, Robin, we're not in Chicago yet. We're only in Denver. And she goes, no, I don't want to go anymore. I'm done. <laughs> I said, no, no, we still have to get on another plane. And she goes, oh, Mimi. And I said, yes, we still have to go on another plane. We're not at our destination yet. Were we started on our destination? Yes, we were on our destination, but we had not arrived yet. So then we had to get out our itinerary again. We had to get some more boarding passes, and then we had to see where we were going to go. Well, it told us, and, and you know something, when you change planes, the gate that you have to be at to go is never right next to the one you just got off of, ever. You have to go a mile <laughs> it seems, to another corridor, even though it's the same airline, but you have to follow the directions and the instructions, and they put all sorts of, of signs up so you know where you're going, and so you have to follow the instructions to get to your next flight, and so to the next gate. So we got to the next gate, and we're, we're waiting, and we're going through the waiting again, and so then they call our plane, they call our and say, okay, it's time to board. Your flight, your plane is here. So we do the same thing. We gather our backpacks and all of our things that we're taking on the plane with us. And off we go down the small aisles again, being courteous not to run into anybody. And we always sat at the back of the plane for some reason. But um, anyway, so there we go. And then we're flying, and we do take off, and we're flying again. And we're in the air for another couple hours. And then we saw this. <gasps> Do you know what that is? That is Chicago. And so we saw Chicago. And the pilot, he says, you are now in Chicago when we landed. And you know what my granddaughter said? She goes, oh, we're on the right plane. So that was a good, and I'm going, phew. I'm, that's, that's a relief to know we're on the right plane. And so we were on the right plane, and everything. we got to Chicago. We got off the plane. My husband's brother came to the airport, picked us up, and then we had to gather, go to, to the baggage area and gather all of our luggage to take with us. And then, but something else you need to know. You need to know when you get to your destination that the people you're going to see are going to be there. So we have, Robin had some cousins she'd never met before. And so we had to make sure they were going to be home. So they were going to be at our destination too. And that's Nathan and Isaac. And so we had to make sure that our family and friends were going to be there with us. Or it wouldn't be the same without them, would it? Do you know, the, our journey with God is kind of like that too. You know, he gives us instructions. Do you know what he gives us instructions through? What does he use to give us instructions? Does anybody know? No. You don't know? Well, let me show you. Maybe that will help. What's this? The Bible. He has written out all the instructions we need. He tells us what we need to do to go to enter and on our destination, to reach our destination. So we start on our journey. And we have the right clothes we're wearing, which is Christ's righteousness. And we, we have everything that we need. And when we have what we need, it's when we have Jesus in our heart. And that's kind of our boarding pass. And when we get to our destination, when we finally reach heaven with Jesus, on the way, we want to make sure that all of our friends and families will be traveling there with us or be there, huh? So can you boys and girls remember that to take Jesus with you whenever you travel and to listen to his instructions that he gives us through his word? And with that, just like we made our right destination, changing planes and everything, 
you will get to the destination that God has ordained for you or planned for you to be at. Won't that be nice? All righty, you may go back to your seats now. Thank you. For worship and giving today, <clears throat> if I can talk, uh, we are going to be giving um, the loose offering. We will go to uh, Oregon Conference Evangelism, and Alex is going to put a short little uh, video about that. between the Oregon Conference and It Is Written has created an exciting opportunity for us to journey together. Originally, it was just going to be a few churches involved, but then we decided, let's go ahead and make it a conference-wide initiative. What I learned pretty quickly was that in Oregon, they don't just talk about supporting evangelism. Oregon Conference supports evangelism. We've had the three It Is Written live sites with the download at 30 plus church sites. So we spent some time talking with pastors and working with them to make sure that the video that we would be putting together would actually be really usable for them. That to me in itself is a great way to try and, and do evangelism. We had churches who their pastors decided to lead out in evangelism. What was really impressive is that we had laymen who stood up and they were amazing with preaching the Word of God. Because of the It Is Written campaign here in Oregon, we are making a difference. And I think that, that this series of evangelistic meeting has given people peace and assurance for the future. And people tell us as they wiped away tears, this has changed my life. I first heard about Revelation today through a um, postcard that came to me in the mail and then through my church in Gold Beach. It was a hard time for me because I couldn't go out because of the COVID thing. I didn't even want to live. And I've studied all kinds of different beliefs, trying to find the one that I thought was the closest to what the Bible taught. I didn't understand all of the studies that I had done. The Great Reset really cemented to me what I needed to know to be able to be baptized. Just the amount of truth and the way that it impacted my life, it really convicted me on certain things and brought out things in my life to work on and bring to God. I've been baptized before, but not in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I decided to get baptized again because of the fact of having new knowledge and understanding. people today, even in our own church, that say public evangelism just doesn't work anymore. But ask the person whose life has been transformed, and they will tell you that it is worth every penny that we spend because their hearts and their lives have been changed by the power of God. So it's, it's important for us as church members that we take this message seriously because there are lives around us who depend on this truth. This major initiative has led to more than 100 individuals who have made a decision to be baptized, which is so exciting to me. All of this was made possible because of your financial help and dedicated support. When you give to Oregon Conference Evangelism, you are supporting local church evangelism cycles and reaping events across the entire Oregon Conference territory. You have the opportunity today to become a one-time or a recurring partner through your generous giving. Thank you in advance for your prayers and financial support. So as we, uh, the uh, uh, deacon stand, please. As we take up the offering today <clears throat> for this uh, Oregon Conference um, evangelism, let's also remember our uh, church budget. 
and our mission projects. And the mission projects is really looking encouraging. Pre appreciate everybody's help and uh, support on that. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to give to you. You've given to us so many ways. We ask you to bless the offerings that are given today, Father. Multiply them and what they're able to do, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family, and happy Sabbath to all. I'm going to be reading in Psalms 16, verses 1 and 2. And I'm reading out of the uh, King James Version. Preserve me, O God, for in you do I put my trust. And O oh, my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness extends not to you. Those who prefer to kneel may do so. Oh, Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, Son, Holy Spirit, our comforter, we come to you on your Sabbath day, and what an amazing day it is. We come to ask you for your guidance and healing hand to rest upon each and every one on the prayer list. You and only you know who those, what those needs are. Also the ones that need that extra helping hand that are too shy to ask for it. Father, please speak to Elder Chuck Austin and through him that he may speak your words to us. We send this prayer to the Trinity. Amen.
not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> I'm going to sing a song about my brother called Jerry's Song. And Chuck asked me to tell the story behind it. So um, I don't know how far back to go, but several, many years ago, my brother had a heroin addiction. And it was really tough. And at the time, he wasn't living at home. So I hadn't seen him for a very long time. And I was wondering, where's my brother at? I haven't heard from him. My sisters and I were worried about him. He always at least sent a card at Christmas. And somehow, my older sister and I started doing some research and found Jerry. Do I need to speak louder? OK. Um, and we found him and, and found out that he was embarrassed and humiliated and ashamed of his heroin addiction and didn't want to be found. He didn't want the family to know what he was going through. And he was trying to remedy it himself. And at some point, he had um, locked himself in a room or asked somebody to lock him in a room for a week to get over his addiction to just uh, go through withdrawals. And he said it was hell. And I just thought, oh, Jerry, I wish I had known I could, be, could have been praying for you. Well, I prayed anyway, but I didn't know specifics. And when I, when I finally got a hold of my brother, uh, he was really glad to hear from me. And I can't remember how I found him and where he was. But in the meantime, I had been asking God. As soon as I found him, I said, Lord, give me a song to sing about this so I can send it to my brother. I just want to help other people. And um, years before that, I had asked God for a ministry. I had asked him, what can I do to help others? Because I don't always know what to say when people are in the crucible. I don't know what to say to comfort right up front. But God gave me the gift of poetry and of being able to write and, and have words flow out in music. And so he, he did that for me. And I, I wrote this song for Jerry. And he gave me a phrase, um, where the blood freely flows is someone who knows the value your soul is worth. That's the first phrase he gave me on this song, and I knew it was going to be very important. And it was important for me to know, too. I needed to hear that. I needed to know that in my soul, that Jesus died just for me. And Jerry needed to know that. And you, you need to know that, too. And when, when Jerry came out of his heroin addiction, he was doing well. He, he received some books from me. He, he wasn't really into Jesus. He had a horrible life. We all did in our childhood, very hurtful things, a lot of um, abuse. And so he was just, he thought, well, I can just be a good person. I won't do this to anybody else. Then later he, he slipped up and went back into it. And my heart was broken. But guess what? My church prayed for him. I prayed for him. My family prayed for him. We just kept praying and praying and praying. And then we got the good news that he had, he's off heroin for good. And he's more open to the Lord. He believes in the Lord. I don't know that he's given his heart to the Lord, but he believes in the Lord. And so I just want to let you guys know that no matter what you're going through, no matter what a son or daughter is going through whatever addiction any of you have or anybody that you love has. Give it to God. God has the answer. And whenever the Lord gives me a song, there's always, there's always the problem, there's always the addiction, there's the heartache. But then he gives the answer. And then there's always the answer, who is Jesus. So if you need to put your, your name in the place of Jerry, or your grandson, or your daughter, or your sister, whoever it is, even if it's yourself, just know that God loves you, and this song is for you, as well as my brother. Love. 
trying to find you. Brother, you've been hurting and your heart is broken in two. Jerry, you are priceless. You are worth the life of the King. He was there to celebrate your birth. Where the blood freely flows is someone who knows the value your soul is worth. Step out from the shadows. Let your face be warmed by his love. There's a lot of dust in the air tonight, today. A lot of dust in the air this morning, isn't there? I don't know about you, but my eyes are pretty watery. All this dust. Uh, I actually heard that song for the first time about a month ago. I was at Central Point Church to speak that day, and Sheila was scheduled to do special music. 
And uh, my message was not the message I'm doing today, but as she sang that song, it affected me the same way as it <laughs> affected me today. And it's to me amazing, isn't it, how God brings things together? God knew I was going to be there to preach that day. God knew that he wanted Sheila to sing that song today. And so I asked Sheila, I have a message I'm going to give in next month. Would you please come and sing that song? And so she did. Thank you, Sheila, for being here. And thank you, Pam, wherever you are, for the courage to get up here and share with all that, all the, the struggle it was. Praise the Lord that people are willing to be of service to the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pam. So the message this morning is, is actually part two. It wasn't planned on being this way, but again, God ordains things. It's actually plant part two of Pastor Daniel's message last week. For you that are here or watch it on um, Better Life Television, Pastor Daniel's message was about the prodigal son and about God's love, God's unconditional love, and how he loves us, and how good he is toward us, and how he doesn't give up on us. And that's what his message was. And unbeknownst to me, that was what he was going to be speaking about. And so this is actually part two of that message, the goodness of God. So before we begin, as I always like to do, you know, I like to pray and say, Lord, please guide and direct this message. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your ordaining things in this, in this world, Lord, just as you ordained that song to be sung a month ago. Lord, you do that so many times, so many times each and every day. We don't recognize it all the time, um, but throughout the world, people are being blessed by how you do things just like that. Thank you, as Sheila sang in her song, that no matter how broken we are, how broken one of our loved ones are, that seems beyond your reach, Lord, that they're never beyond your reach. Thank you for being here with us this morning. And Lord, now as I speak, may I be hidden behind your cross. May it be your message. May I simply be your mouthpiece. Lord, speak to our hearts what it is you would have us to know today about your goodness is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Get my little thing out here. How do we get to that one? Should go backward. Okay, well, somehow that got in there. Okay. Already we're off to a good start here. Okay, there we go. Romans 2 4. Or, you did, or do you despise the richness of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? It's Romans 2 4. So, why would the goodness of God lead us to repentance? Well, it's because when we truly see and understand the goodness of God, it touches our hearts. We realize how that a God could go through what he went through. Take, take upon himself the sins of the world and make that infinite sacrifice for us. And when we see that, his goodness for us, it touches our hearts, or it should touch our hearts anyway, and it leads us to repentance, that we don't want to be in the same place we're at in our lifestyle. We don't want to be making the same choices. We want to turn to the Lord and ask the Lord to change our hearts and to make us into the likeness of his character when we see the goodness of God. In Christ's object lessons, it says, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. So think about that. The last message of mercy to be given to this world is a revelation of God's character, his character of love. How is that character of love going to be given to the world? Through human beings. Through people who are willing to let Jesus take control of their life, and let Jesus guide and direct everything that they do so that the world in its darkness can see the light shining from God's throne and it's shining in our hearts and it goes out from us to others if we truly allow God to be in our heart 
and allow his light to fly, flow out from us. So there are those maybe that say, you know, we need to hear more messages about current events, about the signs of Jesus soon coming. We heard the about God's character of love last week. You know, we need to hear what's going on. We know we're near the end of time. Things are happening rapidly. Jesus is coming soon. We need to hear more of that. And I agree, we do need to understand what's happening in these last days. But we also need to know what kind of character we are going to need to be able to be able to stand for Jesus when this time of trouble comes. If you know everything that's going to happen and you've got it all laid out and you've got every specific detail laid out of what's going to happen at the end of time, but you don't know Jesus, what what good is it to you? What good is it to you? Amen. So as we may or may not know, it's been Satan's purpose. It's been Satan's purpose to misrepresent the character of God to the human race, right? Because he, doesn't, he wants to cloud our understanding of who God is. He doesn't want us to know the true character of who God is. Because if he can get us tweaked in our understanding of who God is, then he can, and he can, he can distort that understanding of who God is, then it will distort how we relate to God, how we see God if we have a wrong understanding of who God is. But what we need to know is we need to know that God has only the best intentions for us. We need to know that God created us for the very purpose of eternal fellowship with him. That's why he created us. Now, we have a glitch in that, we know, because of Adam and Eve's choice. But originally, God created mankind to have eternal fellowship with him. And he's working to... to, to restore that relationship so that we can have eternal relationship with him, fellowship with him. Okay, now, let me go back up this one now. Oops, I'm going back the wrong way here. Somehow I got my things that I've ordered. This is the one I wanted to share. Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet... I will not forget you. Think about that. A woman with a newborn child, a nursing child. What a beautiful scene that is. You've seen pictures of that and you go, ah, you know, or whatever. Or you see that in the the, uh, store or whatever with a woman with just holding this little baby. And it just touches your heart. And you think, how could a woman forget her nursing child? And God's saying, well, even if that was possible, even if even if a woman could forget her nursing child, I'm still not going to forget you. That's how much I love you. That's how much you mean to me. I'm not going to forget you. And you may be familiar with Psalm 139. I love Psalm 139. I know that the group, his song, had actually sang a song about Psalm 139. But the, and what I love about it, it says, where can I flee from your presence, Lord? Where can I go from your presence? You know, if I go to the highest mountain, you're there. If I go to the deepest cave, you're there. If I go on the other side of the sea, you're there. Lord, there's nowhere I can go to to run away. I, I can try to get away from you as much as I want, but you continually pursue me because you love me. You don't want to be separated from me. You, you, you're, you're saying to us, if you only knew what I was like, if you only knew how much I cared about you and what I think of you, you would be wanting to get to know me. If you only knew what I was really like. That's what Psalm 139 is all about, is how God continually pursues us because of his great love for us. You know, this quarter, we've been studying our Sabbath school lesson about being in the crucible with Christ, that refining process that God wants to put us through in order for us to come out spotless, to come out polished. You know, for those that do agate hunting on the beach. You know, you get that agate and stuff and it's all rough and really, you know, it doesn't really look that pretty. But then you put it through the tumbler and you get through it and it goes through and when it comes out, oh, it's so beautiful, polished and shiny. It looks so beautiful. That's what God wants for us as we go through the crucible of life. So the trials, the battlings of the flesh versus the spirit that 
we have in this life, it's only because of the choices that our original parents made. Adam and Eve, they made, choice, they made a choice of choose to eat of that tree. And because of that, we've inherited that defectness of character. And because of inheriting that defectness of character, now we have this battle going on within our very being of choosing the flesh or the spirit. We wouldn't have had that battle had they not made that choice. But we have that battle now because of that. It was never intended to be that way. So really, in other words, what I'm saying there is that the battle, the battle is whether we will make choices, make choices that will follow our own selfish inclination, or our own selfish desires, or will we trust that God has a better way for us, and will we submit that's a hard word for us, right? Submit, surrender, yield. We don't like to surrender. We like to be in control. But will we submit, will we surrender to the working of the Holy Spirit? Do we really believe that the Holy Spirit, that God has a better plan for our life than we do? We may say that, but a lot of times our actions don't reveal that, do we? So before Adam and Eve fell by eating of that fruit that they were forbidden to eat, their very nature, their Um, their very nature delighted in doing the will of God. That was their natural desire, was to do the will of God. It was was a natural inclination to do those things that please God. It wasn't until after they fell that their natural inclination was to do what was only self for me, and how, how I could please myself and take care of myself and find pleasure in what I want. And only those who have been born from above, those who have been born again, as the saying goes, as they've turned to Jesus in repentance and received his spirit in their life, have had that that new birth experience in their life, only they can truly discern or recognize the spiritual battle that they have to fight within their very souls. Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And it tells us that, let me go back here real quick, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And I can tell you before I came to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I can tell you that I did not recognize a spiritual battle going on in my life. I, I did what I wanted to do. All through my teen years, and especially I can remember all through my teen years, my college years, and even in my 20s before I came to know the Lord, I did what I wanted to do. I did that which felt good to me which pleased me. I didn't think of whether this is morally right or morally wrong. I mean, maybe I didn't steal from somebody or go and want to kill somebody, but and from, a, from a, a pleasure sense, I chose to do what I wanted to do as long as I kept within the bounds of the law. You know, I, ch- and sometimes in my, you know, I drank under, underage, so I didn't do that sometimes uh, in the, in the, in the, within the bounds of the law. But I wasn't really thinking what was morally right or morally wrong as I was making some of these choices. It wasn't until after I came to know Jesus that now I recognize there's a battle going on within me. Am I going to choose to do that which is morally right or morally wrong? I actually had a moral compass at that point. At least it was, it was more um, evident to me anyway, let's put it that way. Yet those who are not professed believers, those who don't even profess to follow the Lord, they do have the Holy Spirit working on them, just as Sheila sang about even though her brother Jerry maybe hasn't made that commitment yet that we know of, of giving Jesus uh, his heart, the Holy Spirit is working on his heart. And prayer changes things. So please continue to pray for those loved ones you have. So the Holy Spirit is working on their hearts. Revelation 3.20 says, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. I'm knocking at the door of your heart. I want to come in. I want to have fellowship with you. I want to enjoy a relationship with you. But I'm not going to force my way into your life. I will plead, I will woo you, I will do whatever I can to get your attention and hopefully you'll see that I have your best interest in mind and you'll want to be in a relationship with me. And then the Holy Spirit is also working in that heart, like Jerry's and our loved ones that we have that don't know the Lord yet, to guide them and direct them to make right choices so that they can um, know what it's like to be in um, in fellowship with God and to experience the better intentions he has for them. 
In Titus 2.11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Think about that statement for a second. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Every man, every person, every woman, that's a generic there, obviously, men, every woman, every child, every single person that's ever lived on the face of the earth, the grace of God has appeared to them. Wait a second, Chuck. You mean those people a thousand years ago in the Amazon that never had a missionary come to them and tell them about Jesus, the grace of God had appeared to them? Or those in deep, dark Africa, Africa there in the, in the jungles there where a missionary hadn't been for, you know, until just a few hundred years ago? You mean that the grace of God had appeared to them? How could that be? How does the grace of God work on every single human being that's ever lived on the face of this earth? Through the Holy Spirit, right? Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was, went to these people and moved upon their hearts. Let me share this thought with you from Desire of Ages. Those whom Christ commends in the judgment may have known little of theology, but they have cherished his principles. Through the influence of the divine spirit, they have been a blessing to those about them. Even among the heathen are those who have cherished the spirit of kindness, before the words of life had fallen upon their ears, they have befriended the missionaries, even ministering to them at the peril of their own lives. They've cherished the spirit of kindness. Why? They've responded to the Holy Spirit. They've responded to what the Holy Spirit was doing in their hearts, and, and there was a connection being made there. Going on, it says, Among the heathen are those who worship God ignorantly, those to whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality, yet they will not perish. Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature and have done the things that the law required. Their works are evidence that the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts and they are recognized as the children of God. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Psalm 87, 6 says, the Lord will record when he, when he registers the people, this one was born there. See, God takes into account where a person is born, the opportunities had for light to come into his life, and the choices he's made in response to that opportunity for said light. As we know, obviously people living today in America have much greater opportunities to hear the light, the truth of God's word, than some of those that live in foreign countries that have never even heard the name of Jesus. Okay? So God takes into account where they're born, what availability of light that they have. And we need to remember this also. God is trying to get people in the kingdom of heaven, right? Not to keep them out. He's not to see how tough he can make it on. He's trying to do everything he can. He's trying to, he's trying to, do, he's trying to help us along and, 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 and guide us along as best as he can in getting us in there. He doesn't want anyone to be not with him for eternity. So look at, look at, and maybe you have, maybe you've seen it in your own life, especially in the Word of God. Look at how long suffering God is and has been, especially to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. You know, when you read the Old Testament, uh, the scriptures in the Old Testament, and you see how God dealt with Israel, what do you see? Time and time and time again, these stubborn, stiff-necked people. Nothing like what we are, right? These people would go off into idolatry, worshiping other things other than the true God that created them. They, they, would worship, they would worship gods of other nations and committing some of the most bases of abominations, even sacrificing their own children. And the Israelites, as you read the scriptures in the Old Testament, the Israelites even practiced some of those abominations. The ones who should have known the true God and known how horrible that was, they even went off into idolatry and did some of those same practices, which were actually worshiping these false gods, were actually worshiping, worshiping demonic spirits in reality. And yet we look at God. When they did some of these horrific things, God didn't kick them to the curb and said, I'm through with you. I've had it with you. No. What did God do? He came after them again and again and again because he wanted to win them back to himself. He said, if you only knew me, if you only knew what I'm really like, you wouldn't have any interest in what 
those other gods are offering you. Ezekiel 33, 11, God, says, God speaking here, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked will turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Can you see God pleading with the house of Israel? Don't go down that path. It leads to eternal separation from me, and I don't want to be eternally separated from you. I want to be with you for all eternity. I want to enjoy fellowship with you. Don't go down that path. So what does it mean when it says, but the wicked, who are the wicked? Is it those horrible, horrific people only that sacrifice their children to these false gods on these red hot um, altars? Is it sickening even to think about? Is it those that maybe murder other people or maybe rob other people? Is, Is that the wicked? Who are the wicked? What do we define when we talk about the wicked? Well, it's in, I looked in the, in the Webster's Dictionary. The word righteous, defined in the Webster's Dictionary, is morally right or justifiable, virtuous. And in Webster's Dictionary, unrighteous is, is um, defined as not righteous. Well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? But the other, other thing it says is wicked. Not righteous is wicked. Romans 3.10 As it is written, Paul is actually quoting from the Old Testament here. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. How many are righteous? None. How many of us are righteous? None. Not one. Unless Jesus lives in our heart. But what was dealing with here was that those that in and of themselves, there are none righteous. No, not one. Because this is what our righteousness is really like. Isaiah 64 But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Nothing we can commend to God of any reason why he should even accept us or find us worthy to be found in his kingdom. So who would the wicked be then? The wicked is actually every one of us, including myself, every one of us, before we came to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Every one of us has been a part of that wicked category. But once we know Jesus, we know the, if we know the understanding of the principle of salvation, Jesus took his, our sins upon himself and gave us his righteousness. Our righteousness is only because of Jesus. We have no righteousness of ourselves to commend to God. It's all Christ's righteousness. And like was read in the, the uh, scripture reading this morning, Psalm 16, 1 and 2. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. So we have, as much as that may um, uh, dig at our pride, there is nothing good in us apart from Jesus, apart from God. There is nothing good in us. Anything that's good in us is only because we've responded to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, whether we recognize it or not. Because our hearts, Psalm, uh, Jeremiah 37 says, 37, 9 says, that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So only those who have been born again and live by faith in Christ through the Holy Spirit, only those are righteous. Which leaves all others in the category of the wicked. So again, so my father, though he was a good person and he, um, in in, in the sense of society, was a good person, even helped his neighbors and stuff, self was still in control. He did not want to yield to the the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so in, in essence, he was part of the wicked. He said, myself, like I shared before, before I came to know Jesus, I was part of the wicked. And so often God will discipline the Israelites. I should say he would. Often he would discipline the Israelites, which were his people. The Israelites were his, he would often discipline them by allowing them to go into captivity. And why would he do that? To recognize that the path they were on would only lead to heartache and misery and woe, and it would eventually lead to eternal separation from him. And again, God doesn't want us to be eternally separated. He doesn't say, well, I've got you know, a few million, few billion people I've got through the history of um, this mankind of 6,000 years, so you know, if a few don't make it, oh well. No, 
God doesn't think that way. God doesn't want one single person to not be with him for all eternity. He doesn't want any one of us to be eternally separated. So he led them into captivity. Why? So to, to discipline them, to recognize that this path you're on is not a good path. And as we read the scriptures in the Old Testament, we would see that eventually, eventually the Israelites would see their error. They would see that the, they would see the, the, the error of their ways, and they would cry out to God and plead, God, oh, please have mercy on us, Lord. We realize we did what's wrong. We realize we went the wrong way. Please have mercy on us. And God would raise up a deliverer, and through that deliverer, God would free them from bondage. You know? And when we recognize that we in and of ourselves cannot be what God wants us to be, that we're in bondage, we can cry out to God, and God will send us the deliverer, the Holy Spirit, to... Uh, in the, as Jesus said, he's my representative. And he will deliver us from bondage. So does God still do that in the lives of individuals today? Most certainly he does, doesn't he? I wanna, I'm going to go past this here. So 2 Peter 3.15 says, And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written for you. So notice it says, the long suffering of God is our salvation. So what, me, to me what that's saying is if God's long suffering toward us was the same as our long suffering toward we have each other, guess what? None of us would be saved. Because you know how long we have suffering toward each other. We know, I'll give, you know, they did that to me uh, you know, two, three times already. You know, I've had enough with them now. I'm not going to let them keep doing that to me. But that's not God's long suffering to us. What did God say to Peter? You know, forgive them 70 times seven. You know? So the long suffering of God, because he is so long suffering, there is hope of salvation. Because he doesn't give up on us. He doesn't give up on us. So praise God that he does have love, long-suffering toward us. So when we feel like we are trapped in sin or in despair because we know our life is out of harmony with God's will and we know that, we recognize it, we know, Lord, I'm, I, I, I feel so far away from you. I know I'm not making good choices. I know I'm messed up. And we're in despair because we know, we feel like there's this, there's this gap, this chasm between us. Remember this, remember this little quote from the book Steps to Christ. I love this. There are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ and who really desire to be children of God, yet they realize that their character is imperfect, their life faulty, and they are ready to doubt whether their hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. See, they, they see, my life is so messed up. You know, I, didn't, I don't even, I, don't, I wonder if I ever really, ever really gave my heart to the Lord or not. To such, I would say, do not draw back in despair. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. But we are not to be discouraged. Even if we are overcome by the enemy, we are not cast off, not forsaken and rejected of God. And again, like I shared, the evidence was in looking at the nation of Israel. God didn't kick them to the curb even when they were doing those abominable things of sacrificing their own children to Molech, a false god. We are not forsaken. We're not rejected of God. No, Christ is at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Said the beloved John, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And do not, 1 John 2, 1. And do not forget the words of Christ. The Father himself loves you, John 16, 27. He desires to restore you to himself. Here's the, here's the key part right here. He desires to restore you to himself, to see his own purity and holiness reflected in you. And if you will but yield yourself to him, that's our part, yielding ourselves to him, which is not an easy thing to do when self likes to be in control. If you will but yield yourself to him, he that has begun a good work in you will carry it forward to the day of Jesus Christ. He's begun the good work. He's going to carry it forward to, to its finish. Pray more fervently. Believe more fully. As we come to distrust our own power, let us trust the power of our Redeemer, and we shall praise him who is the health of our countenance. You know, 
sometimes when we have gone on that, deep, that path that it just seems like, you know, we've kept sliding down that slippery slope, sometimes we feel like, I can't come back to God. I've messed up too, big t- too much big time. God knows that I knew what was right, and I chose to go down the slippery path. I can't come back to God. And that's just what Satan wants us to believe. He wants to believe you've gone too far, you can't even come back now. So, but no, it says we need to pray more fervently. We need to believe more fully. So God is asking us to trust him. Will you trust me? But yet, he's not asking us to trust him by blind faith. You know, that um, somebody, for example, that, uh, that you'd never met before and says, hey, uh, um, can, can you hold my wallet for me? I, I've got so many things I've got to deal with here and I've got to go over there. Uh, we're not, you know, God didn't ask us to tr- trust him by blind faith. God has given us evidence, and the greatest evidence, as we know, is on Calvary. All you have to do is look at Calvary, look at the cross. That's the greatest evidence that God can be trusted, that he has our best interest in mind. It's the greatest evidence of his great love and care for us, for us to be willing to trust him, to believe that he has our best interest in mind. And I want to give a little illustration of this. So if I could have a volunteer that is maybe five or six years old. Is anybody here five or six years old? There's somebody back there. Could you come up here? Somebody's five, come on up here. Oh, I love that name, Austin. (laughs) Can you come on up here, Austin? Thank you, thank you for coming up here. Thank you for being a volunteer. Come right on up here, Austin. Okay, so... My name is Chuck Austin. So we have a connection already, Austin. So, Austin, I'm going to bring some things out here, this little bag here. And um, I hope you know that you can trust me, that I have your best interest in mind, okay? Your best interest in mind, okay? So the first thing I have is, I have these two green little eggs here, okay? Now, inside these green little eggs, there's something that you're really going to like. But the other thing is pretty icky. It's not... Ugh. Now, you can pick whatever you want, but uh, let me give you a, a, some a counsel, okay? If I were you, Austin, I would pick this one. So, Austin, which one do you want to pick? You're going to pick that one? Okay. So what's in there? Oh, you know what? I picked the wrong one here. <laughs> Let's hear it. Let's try this again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So... If, 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 this is the first one. If I were you, I would pick this one. Is this one you want? Can you point to it? Okay, this one. So in here, what is in there? It's a 50 cent piece. This is for you. Now, if you would pick this one, what would you, oh, it's a dirty old Kleenex. You didn't want that, would you? You like that piece thing much better, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. Okay, so that's the first test. Okay, now... Here's our second test, okay? So again, two eggs. Each one of them has something in it. One of them has something really good in it, okay? I mix them around here so you don't know which one's which, okay? So one of them has something good in it. One of them, it's pretty icky. Now, again, if if you would willing to take my counsel, I would encourage you to take this one. You can take whichever one you want. Which one do you want? Oh, guess what? It's got... A dollar in there. You made a good choice because you know what was in this one? It was a dirty Kleenex again. That's much better than a dirty Kleenex, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Now, this is the last one, okay? So this is, this is the biggie. This is like, you know, the, 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 the final Super Bowl, if you want to call it, of choices to make. Okay? And so because this is such an important one, I'm going to ask um, my friend Tom to come up here, and he can actually coach you and help you if you'd like, okay? So Tom, come, come right over here and stand here with me if you would, okay? And so Tom, um, I, I've got this for him to choose which one of these eggs. You see these two eggs here? Okay. I certainly do. Okay. And so do you have any choices for him on this eggs here? If I was counseling you, I'd, I'd say this oh. way. Oh, wait, there's something. Oh, uh, what, what, what? oh no, um, uh, let me put this by here. So... Um, you weren't supposed to see that little part there. But now remember, have you been able to trust me in the future? 
In the past, I mean the past. Now, do you think you can trust me again? Okay, so now he's telling you to pick this one. But if I were you, I would pick this one. Which one would you pick? You're going to pick this one? You're gonna, even though he told you to pick this one, and he can see something sticking out of it, and it looks like part of a $5 bill. But you know what? You pick this one. And guess what it is? It's a $5 bill, and it's yours. You know what was in here? A fake $5 bill, a counterfeit $5 bill. Yeah. So you made a really good choice. Thank you, Austin, for being a, a, a volunteer and helping us in this illustration. I'm going with my friend. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So what is the point of that illustration? That God can be trusted, and even though is that little tip of that little counterfeit $5 bill was sticking out there, appearances would say, that's the one I want. I want that... That one that had, looks like something really good to me. But appearances are not always the path we should take, are they? And so God says, it may appear that you're going to have, a, have a, a better um, desire this way. You're going to have a, a better result this way. But trust me on this. Go over here. Do not take this path that seems so much better. Trust what I'm saying. All that glitters is not gold, that's right. And so I know that there may be some that are sitting in this congregation, maybe some that are viewing on our television audience that have said, you know what? God hasn't sure seemed to be there for me. I mean, my home life was horrible growing up. Maybe there was abuse. Maybe there was abandonment. Maybe there was neglect. And you're thinking, God hasn't been there for me. And with that kind of pain and suffering, especially when experienced in childhood, it can take its toll on a person, can it not? And as that person reaches adulthood, bitterness, anger, hatred that has not been resolved from those experiences in in our younger, younger days, those bitterness and anger can come out and manifest itself in expression towards others and our relationship with others. But for those who question whether God is real, whether he really cares for them, maybe you, maybe you know that God is real, but you don't think he really cares for you. Maybe you don't believe there's a God at all because of things that have gone so south in your life and so bad in your life, you don't even believe there's a God. But maybe you believe there's a God, but he doesn't seem to have a lot of interest in me because things have just seem to be overwhelming to me. Know this. That God loves you. His word confirms that he loves us. Whether we feel it or not. See, sometimes because of our circumstances, we don't feel God loves us. And that's where we've got to move away from our feelings and say, do I believe what God's word says or am I going to trust my feelings? God's word tells us that his word is truth. And he says he loves us. God is love. And he's calling for each one of us to come to him He's reaching reaching out to us that we would be willing to come to him so that he can heal our hearts. He can heal our hearts. And so what you can do, you can actually put God to the test. You can say, God, I don't even know if you're up there or not. I don't even know if you're real or not because it sure doesn't seem like you've been in my life at all if if you are real. God, if you are real, reveal yourself to me in some way. Reveal yourself. And God likes challenges. Life do is look at the Bible. God likes challenges. And he will reveal ourselves in the ways that we would not even imagine. And we can try to conspire. Well, maybe he'll reveal himself to me this way. You know what? God isn't going to come up, use our plan. But God loves us and he will reveal himself. We can give that challenge to God. He will reveal himself. But when that does happen, and if he does reveal himself to you, if you're, if, and I shouldn't say if, when he reveals himself to you, when you put that challenge before him. Don't be like the guy that was driving in the mall parking lot and he was trying to get a parking lot, a a parking space close to the door because he was in a hurry and he didn't want to park way, way, way away. 
And so he wanted to get there close. He had to get some things taken care of. And so he can get in his car and get back again. And so as he's driving around looking for a parking space close to the parking lot, he says, God, if you'll find me a parking space close to the door of the mall here, I'll go to church next weekend. And about that time, guy comes out of, the, out of his space, takes off. Says, oh, forget about it, God. I found one. So God just revealed himself to him, but he didn't want to admit it. Right? Because he wanted to do his own thing. So don't be that kind of person that when God reveals himself to you, you try to ignore it and cause it, say it was a coincidence. So remember we talked earlier about Adam and Eve and their choice to disobey God and how because of that choice, it's resulted in um, heartache and misery throughout the world. Those negative characteristics that we see in others and also see in ourselves at times, those negative characteristics are from why? Because we've been listening to the wrong voice. That wrong little voice that whispers in our ears, oh, go ahead and do this, it'll be so much fun. Or you'll find pleasure in this. We've listened to the wrong voice. And those uh, negative characteristics that we have are the same characteristics that Satan had as to why he chose to rebel against God. Because it was all about self-seeking. What's going to bring me pleasure? I'm not... I want to make sure that I, 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 I am taken care of. It's all about me. And when the experiences of our life bring only discouragement and hopelessness, take note of this thought. Take note of this thought in Prophets and Kings. It says this, Into the experience of all, there comes times of keen disappointment and utter discouragement. Days when sorrow is the portion, and it is hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earthborn children. Days when troubles harass the soul till death seems preferable to life. It is then that many lose their hold on God and are brought into the slavery of doubt, the bondage of unbelief. Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providences? We should see angels seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon a foundation more firm than the everlasting hills. And new faith, new life would spring into being. What a powerful thought that is. That if we could pull back the fourth dimension, we would see angels actually working in our behalf, wanting to save us from making the wrong choices that are going to lead to more heartache and pain. If we would only put our trust in God, put our confidence in God, and say, Lord, I put, I put my faith in you, even though it doesn't make sense because it seems like I should go over here. I'm going to trust in you, Lord. I'm going to trust in you. So I have to admit, I can't tell you why. I can't tell you why God is allowing some of those maybe in this congregation, maybe some of our viewing audience, I can't tell you why he's allowing you to go through some of the difficult trials that you're, you're experiencing right now. And I'm sure there are people in this, audience, this congregation or maybe even viewing that are experiencing some pretty difficult trials that the rest of us are not experiencing at this moment. For some, it may be health issues, some very serious health issues. For some, it may be financial. For some, it may be the loss of a loved one through divorce or death. So I don't know why you're going through that difficult time you're going through, that, the, the heartache you're going through because of some of these situations. But I do know this. God is good all the time. And as, and as I said before, he only wants the best for us. And the best for us is what? Is for him, him, is for him to be with us for all eternity. He wants us to be with him for all eternity. That's, that's what his best option is for us. And so... It may not look to some of us, considering our present circumstances, like he really has that in mind for us, especially if things aren't going in our life the way we'd like them to. It doesn't really seem that God has got our best interests in mind. But know, that, know this, that God knows the heartache and pain you're going through. He knows what we're having to deal with, and he longs to comfort us. He longs to wrap his loving arms around us if we will just let him, if we'll just allow him to. He's he's saying, you may not understand now why this is happening or what has happened to you, but it'll become more plain on the other side. It'll become more plain on the other side. I've shared this quote before in other messages, but it, it bears repeating just because of what we're talking about right now. It says, there are homes for the pilgrims of earth. There are robes for the righteous with crowns of glory and palms of victory. 
all that is perplexed us in the providence of God will in the world to come be made plain. The things hard to under, be understood will then find explanation. The mysteries of grace will unfold before us. So there may be things in our life right now that have perplexed us, that are hard to understand why they're, they're happening. Where our finite minds discover only confusion and broken promises, we shall see the most perfect and beautiful harmony. We shall know that infinite love ordered the experiences that seemed most trying. As we realize the tender care of him who makes all things work together for our good, we shall rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And so that's that little thought there, we we have to take it by faith. Because like I said, for us right now, we may be perplexed, we may be in confusion. We may be, there may be things happening that are difficult to understand and we have by faith say, you know what? God's going to make it plain to me on the other side. And I know because I know the character of God, I know what he did for me on Calvary, I'm going to trust that when he makes it plain on the other side, I'm going to see the most beautiful harmony. I'm under, going to understand why the things happened in my life the way they did, even though at the time it didn't make sense to me. And we may not... We may not understand why God allows the fiery ordeals of temptations in our life, the trials, the persecution to come our way, but through it all, through it all, God has a purpose. God has a purpose. In the great controversy, it says, the followers of Christ know little of the plots which Satan and his hosts are forming against them. So we may not even realize what Satan's plotting against us right now at this very moment in our lives. But he who sits in the heavens will overrule all these devices for the accomplishment of his designs. The Lord permits his people to be subjected to the fiery ordeal of temptation, not because he takes pleasure in their distress and affliction, but because this process is essential to their final victory. He could not consistently with his own glory shield them from temptation, for the very object of the trial is to prepare them to resist all the allurements of evil. You see, God doesn't take any pleasure in us being afflicted and us going through persecution. He's not sitting up there thinking, oh yeah, you know, this is what, they really need this and, and I'm glad they're getting it because, you know, no. He knows this process is essential. As difficult as it may be for us, as hard it may be for him to watch us go through it, he knows it's essential for us if we're going to develop the faith that we need to be able to stand when more difficult times come to us in the future. So he doesn't allow anything to happen in our life arbitrarily. He doesn't have, it, it, it it, it, it isn't just by happenstance. But if whatever happens in our, in our lives, he will use it for the salvation of souls and for his glory. I'm going to go past this one here for the sake of time. Uh, so um, let me back up there. Oop. Okay. So the goodness of God, the goodness of God, as we sang about here in that song, I love that song, by the way, I love the message in that song. The goodness of God may never be fully understood on this earth in, in, a, in a sense that we could give a clear explanation of what the goodness of God is all about. Hopefully we're experiencing the goodness of God in our life bit by bit and it's becoming more and more clear to us how good God's, God is to us. But we may not be able under, to be able to explain it fully at, at, through, a, through a, an explanation. As Romans 11 uh, 34 and 30, 33 and 34 say, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? For who has become his counselor? So, again, the trials we go through, the persecution we face, we, can't under, we may not be able to explain the goodness of God. Why is God allowing this? Because his depths of his riches are beyond of his wisdom and knowledge are beyond what we can even grasp with our little finite minds. So when we begin to question God, why are you letting this happen to me, God? Why did you let this happen? We need to go back to that most popular verse in the Bible, and I know you know what it is, Romans 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. No wonder it's the most popular verse in the Bible because it's a it's like a, um, a summary of God's love toward us. That he loved us so much that he was willing to give himself, his son. And the great sacrifice that God made in our behalf. Because he wants us to be with him for all eternity. He wants eternal fellowship with us. 
So when we begin to question why you're letting this happen to me, just go back and look at the cross and know that I may not understand why this is happening, Lord, but I know you love me. I know you love me. So I want to, uh, just to give a little picture again of the character of God, his love for humanity. I want to share this story. I shared this in a message I gave here probably two or three years ago, but again, it bears repeating as we close out this message. Um, this this, this uh, story, I think, illustrates God's love. This does to me in a great way. And it's a true story. It's a, a woman who lived in Michigan, and her and her husband were visiting with um, one of the administrators in the uh, Michigan uh, conference there. And uh, he, had, he was a pastor, but he was a, a serving as an administrator at that time. And so this woman came to this pastor and said an experience that she had. She just wants to say, I want to tell you about my dream. I want to tell you about a dream I had. I had been praying because I wanted to understand the goodness of God. I want to understand how deep his love for for humanity is and how deep his love for me is because the Bible says God is love. So I was praying, God, please show me your love. Please reveal to me, Lord, how great your love is. And she said she had a dream. And in that dream, she saw herself in the New Jerusalem. And there were all the redeemed within the New Jerusalem. And the the walls of the city were like a a transparent transparency. And she could see out beyond the transparency of those walls. And she could see all those who had not chosen Jesus as her Savior. And because she knew the Scriptures, she knew that Jesus from Revelation 20 verse 9 was about to rain down fire from heaven and destroy those who chose not to to follow him. Not because God wanted to put vengeful punishment on them, because he knew that in mercy they would not want to be in heaven because it would be torture to their souls. And so she understood that. And so she she saw all those out on the other side of the wall. And as she was looking out on the other side of the wall, her eyes met someone. It was her son. It was her son on the other side of the wall. And he was coming toward her, and their eyes were locked. And he got to the wall, and he was scratching on the wall, and he said, please help me. Please, please help me. At that moment, the Lord spoke to her in her dream. Now you know my love. If you have a loved one, who doesn't know Jesus, and it's your desire for them to be in the kingdom of heaven, you know that God loves them more than you do. That's the great love that God has for each and every one of us. He's never going to give up on us. We'll only give up on ourselves. He's going to do everything he can to bring us to be with him for all eternity. Um, It's time for our closing song. We're going to sing another newish one. You guys will probably recognize it. It's called Breathe by Michael W. Smith. Um, It's a good, it's pretty easy to catch on with it because the lyrics are like repetitive and, and we're going to sing it twice. So you'll be able to join the second time. You guys are welcome to stand up. I would encourage you to. This is the air I breathe This is the air I breathe Your holy presence Living in me This is my Just 
desperate for you. And I Father, may that be the plea of our hearts, that we, that we hunger and thirst after righteousness. And Lord, that you would put that willingness in our heart, if we don't have it, Lord, that you would put that willingness in our heart to hunger and thirst after righteousness, because Lord, as we sang the song, we are lost without you. Thank you that you don't want us to be lost, that you're doing everything you can that you're revealing your love to us in amazing ways. Please continue to, to come to us and to live in us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.